All right, uh, I am, uh, I'm Michael Thomas Petralia. I work at the Harvard Microbiotics Lab with Ben and Rebecca. Uh, they describe some of my research. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different route today and go through some, some science in the news type stuff. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD candidate and I do all the, the soft robotics type of things. So if you have questions on that, we can talk uh, during the question and answer section. Um, yes, I can speak up. So uh, the, the first part of my talk is gonna be the view of our research through the lens of the media. And the second part is gonna be the view of our research through, through my view, through my odyssey in graduate school and, and the experiences that I've gone through. And I hope through kind of presenting these two different views, you can get a better idea of how to connect what goes on in the lab with what, uh, what you read in the, in the newspapers and uh, on the internet. So let's first remember uh, what Ben told us about the microbiotic fly, which is that it still needs training wheels. So it's important to, to think about what he told you and, and the state of the art in those robots um, when you're reading these news articles. So we, we have our robotic fly, and you guys all saw it lift off. And as Ben pointed out, there's really nothing on board. There's just this we have a laser pointer. Is it this one? Um, so we have just this one actuator here, or motor, or engine, or thing that makes something move. And we have wings, and we have some transmission between them and some frame holding up, and that's pretty much it. There's no electronics, there's no power, there's no control, uh, there's no sensing. And what this proved was that we could actually make a fly fly, and that our research was worthwhile, and that we should continue forward and try to make small electrical components, small batteries, and uh, continue down the research path. Um, so if we continue to think about the analogy of the training wheels, right? We've got our fly, and in the spring of 2007, and our, our little boy is on his training wheels. He's got a pretty cool bike, and he's very happy that he can, he can roll around. Um, we move to the, the present, and he's got a, a more awesome bike, right? He's got big <laughs> wheels, right? He's got a, like a cup holder on here. It's a little sippy cup. He's got a cool helmet with a visor. He's cruising. And this is kind of where we, we are right now. We've got better looking wings, right? We've got uh, little actuators on the side that, that kind of help us do some control. But we still have training wheels. We, we haven't, you know, it's three years down the line, which based on what you've seen in the news may seem like a long time, but it's not. We, we've made a lot of progress. Um, not so distant future, let's go a year or two down the line. Maybe we actually will take the training wheels off, right? We'll shrink the bike down, we'll get an even cooler helmet, uh, we'll add different mechanical things, right? And, and we, can, we can start to roll around without the training wheels. Uh, certainly this bike can't do everything, and this, this little boy, I guarantee you, he's dreaming of, of, of being Lance Armstrong, right? He wants to, he wants to win the Tour de France. Uh, and this is kind of what we think, right? We're, we're down the line, we dream big. And we want to make, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a swarm of, of bees. We want to make robotic insects that can go around and pollinate crops, that can uh, save people or, or find people in, in hurricane wreckages and things like that. And unfortunately, this may be how the media portrays what we're currently doing. They may take our results and say, well, we've created a fly that flies, so this is not too far off. And unfortunately, it is. It's, it's not going to be in a year or two. It's probably going to be, I don't know, 10 to maybe 30 years before we actually get there. Um, I kind of make this statement of hundreds of years of, of man hours, and let me explain that. Each of those incremental improvements, adding a battery to the, the, uh, to the fly, adding control systems, they all take one, two, three, six different PhD students all doing their dissertations, working on those incremental improvements. And they, they all help, but it, you add them up, and it's, it's hundreds of years of research that needs to take place. And a lot of it happens in parallel, so it's not going to be 100 years before we see these, but it's not going to be a year or two. Uh, which, as you will see in the examples of the, the news articles, they seem to imply that, and some of them seem to even imply that we have these things today. Um, so right here we have the, the meteor coverage from the Harvard Microrobotics Lab page, which you guys can all go to and read these articles. If you Google microrobots, I think we're the first link. You can click on the media tab and get all these articles and, and many, many more um, to, to look at yourselves. This first one that I point out, I, I actually love this article because they talk about the outreach that we do. So outreach is one way that scientists communicate with uh, everyone else who, who isn't a scientist. Um, and we can explain our research uh, like right from our mouth. Right? We can tell you exactly what's happening. It's not through some reporter or through somebody who blogs about it. And I love that they, they quoted Ben here when he said that real life robots aren't as exciting as movie robots. You know, they're clumsy, awkward, and can't do what movie robots can do. So these, you know, our, our soft robots are not the Terminator. Right? We didn't make the bat cape. We made like some robot that, that folds into an airplane or you know, uh, some little thing that does this. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, but uh, that's my PhD. Um, 
It's okay. Mike, yeah. I can certainly speak up. I'll yell. Um, so we can we continue on, and uh, this is an article from the Harvard Crimson, which is Harvard's own kind of news source, and it says, "Not your grandma's robot." So this was published before the fly actually flew, and they do an excellent job at describing the dreams. So it's hard when you're when you're writing an article to describe the dreams and make sure they come across as dreams and not reality. So they'll quote us, and they won't use quotes like Ben's where we call them clumsy because that's not very exciting. They'll use quotes like, we're going to make robo bees, and we're going to pollinate crops. And it's kind of taken out of context. And, and this is beautiful because you know, imagine a robot so small and light, it could hover in the air on a fly's wings. Robert J. Wood, who, who's our advisor, thinks he can make this happen. They're, they're letting you know it hasn't happened yet, but he wants to make it happen. And the, you should actually read the article. It's, it's great. Um, they go through and they, they make a point to say the only thing is these micro creatures haven't yet left the ground. So they point out that it hasn't happened yet, and that's what you know. That's what you should look for when you're looking to news sources is that that honesty, because you know that when they just say you know robot flies, that, that's not the whole story. Um, this is uh, I, I like this article as well, but I, I have a little bit of an issue with the title. So we have robot insect takes off, and then this little subtitle, researchers have created a robotic fly for covert surveillance. <laughs> so does anybody think that the robots you saw tonight are, good, are doing covert surveillance anytime soon? Now you're going to see one tonight flying? You're not. Um, so it, it, it's the article, like I said, the article is good, and they make a point to say, well, much work remains to be done. Small flying machines could one day, you know, one day, not many, many days from now, someday. Like, one day be used as spies for detecting or spies or for detecting chemicals. So uh, they also have a very very narrow view of what they could be used for. Small point uh, compared to the, the covert surveillance. On page two, not on the, on the front page but on the back page, they do mention that at the moment the fly is limited by a tether. So this is great because they are one of the few articles to talk about the the real limitations, right? So we we're looking for in our news articles for for limitations for uh, time frame. Oops, sorry, I lasered people. Um, for, for time frame and for uh, what is the future work? Because no research is ever complete, right? We're always pushing forward. Uh, so they actually list the future work that needs to be done. They were currently working on flight controller, onboard power, sensors, uh, developing software. And again, each one of these is, is like six years of, of some student's time and, and often like a couple students' time. So this is, you know, to, to write it in a small paragraph, that's, I don't think you get the magnitude of how much effort that really takes. And we'll see another example where they even slim it down uh, more into like eight words. Uh, this one's great, right? Tiny robots are ready to spy on us. So they're, they're ready. They're going to spy on us tonight. This, is, this guy's going to spy on me. Um, we all know that's not true. And uh, you know, this is just some technology blog. But you know, they're saying things like, tiny robots and spying machines are all the rage these days. Everybody's doing it, right? Everyone's creating micro-robotic flies. They're, yeah. Just not true. Um, robotic, uh, robot helps, become, helps you become a fly on the wall. Okay. You know, cl clever and, and kind of cute, but definitely not true. And they, they list James Bond as a really good, uh, as a, as a related tag, which I, I thought was funny. Um, and they, they actually say in the article, a new spying gadget with even James Bond would be proud to have his armory. Uh, as though James Bond has anything this cool. Um, but they don't, you know. They're, they're not ready yet. And they also say listening robot, right? So, so we get what they mean here. They're like, oh, this robot can be used for surveillance. And they put it in quotes. But none of our robots have any sensors of any sorts. They're, they're not listening to anything. So again, they're, 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 you know, they're missing the point, And they're, they're kind of they're, they're lying to you. And I apologize for that. Um, they do mention that we're not going to be fooling any secret agents uh, because it only moves straight up. <laughs> Eight words, only move straight up. That is 15 people, six years of their life. That is you know, a ridiculous amount of effort. It is all this stuff. And they, they sum it up in eight little words. Uh, it breaks my heart. So uh, the last one here is the, the fly that's also a spy. Again, it's just a, a little blurb. And they, they don't provide enough information to be useful. But they imply that the military is going to use these for surveillance. And I am sure hope they're not holding their breath and waiting for them. Um, so, so to kind of sum this up, I, you know, I hope it came across the, the message isn't that our robots aren't useful or that we're not going to get there, um, because we will get there in a certain length of time. The, the messages are to be skeptical of what is not mentioned in an article. right? So a lot of these articles didn't tell the whole story. They left pieces out. They left out the length of time 
that it takes for the research to be done. They left out the limitations, the future work. Some of them mentioned it, some of them didn't. Uh, so just because it isn't mentioned doesn't mean it isn't important. All of those things are important to how science impacts your lives. Right? If you expect that these are ready to spy on you, you're going to look around, you know, you're going to be swatting flies and trying to kill them all because you think they're robots. Um, and they leave out the most important parts. And whether they're trying to spin an interesting story or they just don't have room, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't know. So, so my advice is to read a number of different sources if you have time, right? It, so if you can, put together the story. So we looked at six different articles, and they, they really got a, a, you know, through all six of them, we could kind of piece together what actually happens. What is the state of the art? How far have we come? And they, they actually didn't tell the whole story. They, they left out how long until we actually see robots. Nobody said that. And maybe that's because we haven't told anyone, because nobody wants to hear that they're going to take 10 to 30 years, but they probably will. Um, and if you don't have time, I mean, a lot of people don't have time, you just read the headlines. Understand that like, they're, the headlines don't say it all, and just recognize that all this stuff is behind the scenes. Um, and this advice, and I want you to take this to heart, because I want to I wanna see emails from people. Uh, maybe some people don't, and some researchers don't, but I do. Uh, communicate with scientists to fill in the pieces. So we work really, really hard to, to understand everything that can be known about our specific little piece of research. And a lot of times, we're the expert, right? Because the expert is just the guy who knows more than everybody else on, on, on the topic. And if it's our research, of course, we're the guys who know more than anybody. And we want to, you know, we love to talk about ourselves. Everybody does. Um, so, so please ask us questions. If you, if you want to know how long it's going to take, find someone's email. Find a graduate student and, and email them. Um, it's the 21st century. <laughs> um, second part of the talk, I want to go through my odyssey, my continuing odyssey through graduate school. So the, the two goals of the last part of my talk, the first one, I, I want um, some people here to gain more insight into the, the research tasks that need to be completed, and then some of the associated time frames of these research tasks. How long does this stuff actually take? And the second one is understanding that jargon, which is the language you hear when we say dielectric elastomer actuator, or ionic polymer metal composite, or piezoelectric, this is literally a foreign language. If we were having a conversation and I started talking in Spanish, you would say, Mike, like, hold up, you're not speaking English anymore. Why, like, speak to me in English. That's my language, that's what I speak. And this is quite literally what, what jargon is. This is quite literally those words you don't understand. So there's no need to be afraid to, to ask if you don't understand it. I know a lot of my family and friends say, I don't want to look stupid, you know, you use the word motor, and you use it in a way that doesn't make sense to me. I thought I knew what a motor was, but now I don't. And it's, it's because my peers and, and the people I interact with every day use it in a specific way. And I may, by accident, use it that way, and just ask, just say, hey, I didn't quite, you know, you're using motor in a weird way. You're saying uh, actuator motor engine. You're saying they're all the same things. I don't think they're the same things, and I can explain it further. Um, you know, so I just kind of want to clear that up. Like, no, you know, we, we speak a language, and you wouldn't be embarrassed to, to ask someone to not speak Spanish. Um, so now let, let's start at, at my little timeline of my graduate experience. I actually started, uh, I wanted to do schools of micro-robotic fish. So I was interested in how do fish communicate, and can we make a set of micro-robots that communicate in the same way as fish. Um, I didn't actually end up doing that because I freaked out. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, so, so graduate school is really hard. I said it's, it's six years of your life and you're, you're working and you don't get any credit and everyone is, is saying, why aren't your robots ready? I saw them in the news and you're going, well, I, you know, it does this, right? <laughs> like, you know, uh, so I freaked out. I, I, I left and um, I kind of wanted to get my head on straight. I went to industry for a year, worked in transit technology, uh, putting computer systems on buses and you know, boring stuff that we can talk about if you want. Um, then I came back in, in the winter of 2008 and refreshed and, and ready to, to work. And my advisor, Rob, was starting this new project called ChemBots, or Chemical Robots. And this was, I think, the first DARPA-funded and maybe the first funded grant to actually explore soft robotics. So now the, the military is putting money towards it to say, hey, we're really interested in soft robots. Let, you know, let's do this. Um, and there's something called DARPA Hard, which is, you know, near impossible, right? They give you money and they set these goals that you can't ever possibly meet. And they give us two years to do this. They said, in two years, can you make a robot that can squeeze through a hole one-tenth its size? Can you squeeze a softball through a hole the size of a quarter, approximately? Can, can, you know, and can you do what the octopus did? Can you do what Mother Nature learned how to do over, over millions of years? Can you do it in two? <laughs> um, so we did it. It wasn't squishy. It was, uh, it was actually using origami, and I, I don't have pictures because I don't think iRobot will let us show those. But um, 